Ready to Lira, which has a uh, children-specific domestic violence program. To give you some information about what we're actually going to be speaking about today, we have um, defined what abuse on contact means. And basically, um, in a nutshell, what it means is post-separation violence. So it's wider than just abuse that occurs at contact handovers, although this is an, an element of the abuse on contact. Um, we would argue it occurs because the system, the legal system fails to prioritise issues of domestic violence in decision making, legal policy and legislation and this results in children and their mothers being exposed to ongoing abuse and, um, and in the worst case scenarios even death. Um, often the perpetrator's physical access to the primary target of the abuse, who is the adult woman, um, is limited perhaps by court orders or the separation itself and often the forum for ongoing abuse will move to children and litigation around children. Just for your own information that um, the issue of abuse on contact has had a long history with our service. Um, back in 2000 um, and even in 1999 really, services, our services um, began to meet about this issue. Um, it began to arise more, um, I suppose, um, distinctly in the casework that we were dealing with. Um, and um, at that time we did a report um, um, called, called an unacceptable risk. So the reason that we decided to um, put together this training package is that the statistics are pretty startling. As we all know, at least one woman on average a week is killed in Australia by a partner or ex-partner. So far in 2015, there is an average of two women per week being killed in these circumstances. For children who have been killed in the domestic violence contact, the perpetrator's relationship with the children has been described as secondary to his intermediary abuse of them to abuse their mother. In research by Carol Johnson in Western Australia of fathers that killed their children in the context of separation, she found that domestic violence was a significant factor in all cases. In a recent report of 2015 report by the New South Wales Domestic Violence Death Review Team, they found that 75% of children killed by a parent between 2000 and 2010 lost their lives in a domestic violence context. In 52% of those cases, the children had never been the direct target of, the, of their father's abuse, but were typically exposed to their father perpetrating abuse against the mother. In nearly 40% of cases, the direct abuse of children and DV co-occurred within the family. The killing of children in a domestic violence context, context is therefore being described as not only the ultimate act of child abuse, but a demonstrable manifestation of domestic violence in, in itself. We would argue that lawyers having good liaison and communication with domestic violence services is extremely important. Domestic violence services have the knowledge and exper expertise to assess risk um, in, in relation to both women and children. Um, and risk assessment um, can be very important for lawyers to know about to assist the structuring of legal arguments and can form the evidentiary basis on how they approach and run their legal case. Obviously, this knowledge needs to be obtained with consent. An interesting footnote is that just at the coronial inquest into the Darcy Freeman death that took place in Victoria the week before last, the role and responsibility of lawyers in relation to family violence was a key consideration. So we will await that coronial report with interest. Also in Queensland in the Not Now, Not Ever report by um, the Queensland Domestic Violence Task Force on Domestic Violence, they made a number of recommendations relating to lawyers and standards and ongoing professional development and training of lawyers, particularly in relation to the intersection of family law and domestic violence. So that's just some um, key interest um, for, for lawyers to, to look out for movements in relation to the role of lawyers in this area. 
Back to the training package itself, what we argue is that um, we all must share the risk and accountability for our responses to domestic violence, both before the event and after any tragic events through domestic violence death reviews. The burden for safety and risk is too great for one sector to bear by itself. Everyone, but especially those who work with post-separation families, need to have a heightened awareness of safety and risk and be better able to respond. It is exactly the time that women see family lawyers about issues of domestic violence and family law that our clients and their children are potentially at greatest risk. We approach the training package on the base that, basis that early intervention and prevention is um, key. So making good and early referrals to domestic violence services, screening for and identifying domestic violence in children, adult victims and perpetrators. And this is obviously wider um, than just lawyers. This is for the community sector as a whole. Being able to more easily identify high risk matters and red flags and act on them accordingly is key. These were our takeaway points from the training um, session. Um, I'll let you read through those yourself. But basically um, what runs through, a common theme that runs through these um, takeaway points is the interrelationship between violence against women and violence against children. In relation to um, legal agreements, Again, when we were speaking to community workers, um, we spoke about how um, their early intervention could be key. Um, uh, you know, their early intervention to actually refer uh, clients over to lawyers can also be key to safety because uh, we see so many women who have already entered into 50-50 arrangements um, at our service, at Women's Legal Service, in circumstances of domestic violence. and. Um, we really, um, that makes it quite difficult for our lawyers to then try to unpick those agreements. So obviously, if they could get good legal advice as early as possible, um, that's really important also in relation to safety. Uh, I'm just going to um, skip through this as well. This is really just saying that there are huge systemic issues that are at play that result in, um, um, I suppose, these agreements um, or these possibly unsafe agreements. Um, being either ordered or agreed to. Um, you can see their child safety withdrawals if there's a proof parent. Um, there's issues in relation to the domestic violence courts naming children. Um, and um, in the family law um, system, um, it, it can be argued that providing a child for contact equates to being a good parent. I'll just skip through that. Just really sort of establishing what's the evidence for abuse on contact or why we're seeing children or mothers coming to services concerned about their children being abused on contact. Um, you can see that there was the eighth research of the post-2006 family law reform and what it showed that overnight contact was commonly ordered by the family law courts when there was domestic violence irrespective of the allegations and the weight of um, evidence. Um, the extensive reviews of the 2006 amendment of the 2006 family law amendments were commissioned by the Australian government as well as independently conducted by interested stakeholders and the results were conclusive. While the 2006 family law reforms had a positive impact in some areas, the research indicated that the 2006 Act had failed to adequately protect children and other family members from family violence and abuse. There's also research recently by the Australian Institute of Family Studies into the role of independent children's lawyers and their role. And, and what that found was um, that children were clearly, and this is from the report, that children were clearly in unsafe and inappropriate parenting arrangements as eventually shown by the outcome of family law proceedings. And there is some telling research also by Estelle and Gray, which I'm going to have to just skip through. Again, um, in a wider context, if, um, there's some concern in relation to that this is an issue that's just being raised by women's services, but the Law Council of Australia has actually acknowledged the issue um, in, their Senate in, their, um, in, in, their, in the Senate inquiry into domestic violence in Australia that's currently on foot. 
Um, just for your own information, there is some legal information on our website um, that could provide some support and assistance to lawyers and community workers. And also this website by 1800 um, Respect um, about for workers and professionals um, who work with um, women in um, domestic violence situations that could be of assistance as well. Um, just in relation to systemic issues, what we are asking for is um, as a matter of urgency, the development of specific risk factors specific to children, building on existing knowledge of domestic violence risk for adults. Um, we're asking for a national approach to domestic violence death, um, urgent recognition in child protection and family law, where there's violence towards women, children are at significant risk and obviously um, really um, appropriate and specialised domestic violence risk screening and risk assessments across the legal system. You'll see there I put the sources in for you. That's the end of my um, fairly introductory um, um, talk. I'm now going to hand over to Beck Shearman who's going to take you through some um, issues in relation to domestic violence um, risk and safety assessments. Hi, my name's Beck. I'm the Operations Manager at the Domestic Violence Action Centre in Ipswich. Um, if you can just um, bear with me as well while I'm getting myself a little bit set up. Um, I guess I wanted to reiterate that this is really just a taste or an introduction for what um, was, was a much bigger presentation that we initially developed and we'd be keen to continue that work with people. What I'm going to run through with you is some of the stuff that we would talk with people about in general in terms of setting a bit of a um, baseline in terms of domestic violence and risk indicators and maybe also the presentation of uh, victims and offenders as well. So just in terms of the start, I always like to talk about forms of DV. I also like to say generally that we uh, use a fairly working definition of what domestic violence is to start with as well at our service. So generally what we're discussing or what I train workers to do and what I do in training with other workers is um, to look for three key things when it comes to DV. We're looking for patterns of behaviour. Um, so domestic violence is not a one-off incident of violence like many people do consider. It's actually a range of different behaviours um, occurring over a, a period of time. Uh, and power and control is the second thing we're looking for. So that the purpose of that behaviour or the intent of it is to for one party to have control over the actions of the other. The result of that is often fear of the victim and that's the third thing that we're looking for. So really looking for patterns of behaviour uh, patterns of uh, behaviour using power and control tactics causing fear. Uh, that's a fairly good definition um, in terms of identifying whether domestic violence exists or not. I also like to talk with people about the forms of domestic violence. Um, there are a number really. Uh, initially, or mainly what we focus on, most people understand that um, physical violence is a common element of domestic and family violence. Of course, that's punching, hitting, kicking, with physically restraining people, pushing, um, throwing things at someone. So often women don't even consider the physical abuse they're experiencing as physical abuse because they don't have black eyes or broken bones, but um, they've had things thrown at them, they've had walls smashed next to their head, they've been pushed or restrained or um, stopped from leaving a room or the house. Um, verbal abuse is a fairly common part of most DV. So what, what we're talking about there is uh, yelling at someone, swearing at them, name calling, generally unpleasant behaviour. Um, usually very derogatory as well. So, and often we find that part, that verbal abuse is quite common. Social abuse is probably what you think. It's restricting uh, the victim's access to friends or family, and that can happen via you know a few different methods. It can be via um, starting fights with friends and family, making uncomfortable for them to visit, saying that they don't trust friends and family members. Um, or moving 
the victim and family away from friends and family, so geographically isolating them as well. Uh, economic abuse, most of you would be familiar with in that DV legislation, but really it's restricting a woman's access to um, income or uh, not sharing decision making around the use of finances. So women even make, could still be working and be economically abused if they are having all of their pay taken, for example. Um, economic abuse makes it very difficult for women to leave as well when they don't have access to the resources of the household. So one of the, it's one of the three things that we know keeps women in violent relationships. There are three indicators um, of women staying. Um, one of them is economic dependence on the perpetrator. One is social isolation, and the other one is fear of reprisal from that perpetrator. Um, sexual abuse is quite also quite common, but probably less spoken about by victims as well. So that's anything from unwanted touching or being forced to watch porn right through to rape and sexual assault. Uh, women are much, like I said, much less likely to talk about sexual abuse or disclose it, especially to lawyers. But and also to um, you know social work professionals as well doesn't mean it's not happening. We do ask about it. The reason we ask about sexual abuse is sexual violence is one of the high risk indicators that I'll be talking about later. Psychological abuse is often linked to the other types of abuse, but it's more that what we might call crazy making behaviour, the name calling, the denigrating, the constant put downs, the brainwashing type behaviour that women, many women describe. So that's where women say that their worth as a person is constantly denigrated, so they're constantly called a bad woman, a bad mother, a bad wife, fat, ugly, hopeless, useless, stupid. Um, when someone's calling you that every day or multiple times a day, it's hard to you know, withstand the assault, essentially. Um, reproductive control is where women are forced to um, have children that they don't want to have. or so. Reproductive control really relates to the number, timing and spacing of children not being up to women at all and it's not negotiated, it's just a decision made by him. So there's some truth in the um, stereotype I guess about the bre uh, pregnant barefoot and in the kitchen. So women who are constantly pregnant or with young children are much easier to manipulate hard, and it's much harder for them to leave. Uh, and we certainly occasionally see women who um, had many, many children, not of their choice, and it's a strategy by the perpetrator to keep her under control. Uh, technological abuse is one of the things that's happening much more frequently these days. Uh, it's monitoring and stalking and surveillance, but using technology to do it. So that includes things like using GPS technology to track women, putting it on phones or in your GPS tracker in your car. It's also loading software onto um, computers, tracking emails, even directly accessing women's computers once they've once left the home to monitor them. It could also be things like installing cameras or other listening devices in the home to monitor what she's doing when he's not there. Um, Simon Gitney, who threw his partner Lisa Harnham off the balcony and was convicted of that last year, was a classic example of that. He monitored her extensively using technology and Again, high levels of stalking and surveillance like that, that sort of obsession is a high risk indicator as well. So it's not always what we think uh, in terms of risk indicators. Property damage can be quite a common thing. You'd be looking for who's, what's the purpose of the property damage. There usually is a purpose. It's usually her stuff that's been damaged or it's her access to the outside world like her phone, computer, um, car, or it's things that she holds dear like photos or other memorabilia. Medications are something that often gets damaged as well. Threats, I'll talk again about risk indicators, but any threat should be taken seriously. Uh, threats to kill are extremely concerning. Any threat to kill is a risk indicator. The more specific the threat, the more risky the, the more risky it becomes, basically. It's a similar principle to what we talk about in suicide training, where if someone says they plan to kill themselves, you ask them if they have a plan. If they have a plan, then they're much, more, they're much more likely to do it. Same thing applies with DV. If they make specific threats about the, what they intend to do, you need to take that very seriously. Stalking and surveillance, like I mentioned, can be often using technology these days, but can often include just the good old fashioned stalker out in the bushes waiting to, seeing what she's doing, 
We certainly have worked with women who've had their partners hiding in the ceiling in the attic for extensive periods, sometimes weeks, to monitor her. Could be driving by the house, not multiple times, or getting other people to do it. Cultural and spiritual abuse relates to not allowing women to practice their culture or religion um, or denigrate them for doing so, up to and including um, uh, denigrating them for the food that they cook or for having cultural beliefs or spiritual beliefs to, to start with, or not, not allowing them to attend church, or using um, religious beliefs to justify abuse is another thing that we see there. Those are the main ones that we've encountered. If you have anything else, I'd love to know. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is risk assessment. So risk assessment is not just a tool, it's not just a tick and flick that you do, it's actually a comprehensive process that usually also includes safety planning as part of it. But we're really trying to get a sense of the specific or unique risk that applies to, a, to a woman and her situation. We need to remember that um, risk is a dynamic uh, concept in that uh, risk can change over time. So the changing of a couple of key factors can change the level of risk significantly. Um, there is a quite a lot of knowledge um, underpinning risk assessment now. Um, the evidence that we have from the uh, DV death reviews around the, the world basically have told us a lot about what is particularly risky in a domestic violence situation. Um, and one of the things that the DV death reviews have also told us is that it, it needs to be more than DV services alone that are aware of what the risk indicators are. Essentially, everyone needs to know risk indicators in order to make women and children safer. Um, and that includes you guys, lawyers. <laughs> um, we also know that the safety of children is tied to the safety of their mothers. So that is, if mothers are unsafe, their children are likely to be unsafe too, even if we don't perceive that initially. Um, Predictors of risk, I'll just run through them quite quickly now. So and I'll tell you the answer to that question at the end in terms of what the top five risk indicators are. Um, pregnancy is one of the risk indicators. So women who are pregnant or have been pregnant in a DV relationship, that it really is, it, there's been some interesting research to suggest that up to 25% of women uh, reported in a DV relationship that the uh, physical violence either commenced or intensified during pregnancy, which is counterintuitive to how we tend to treat or codify um, pregnant women generally. So pregnancy makes women more at risk. That seems to be because uh, it's about her being locked in. Once she's pregnant to him, she's got far fewer options in terms of leaving and maybe emotionally or psychologically less prepared to do so because they're having a child together. Um, access to weapons is a critical thing and when I say weapons I'm not just talking about guns or knives, I'm talking about if he has ever used a weapon, any tool other than his hands to physically abuse her or threaten her, that is a risk and remains a risk. It uh, indicates his propensity or potential to do that again in the future. Um, like I said, threats or attempts to kill uh, need to be taken seriously. Another question that we ask, it's a tough question, believe me, is that whether women believe that he could kill her. Um, if she believes that he could kill her, you need to believe that. One of her perception of her risk is actually extremely accurate. Strangulation or choking um, is a really uh, dangerous activity for a lot of different reasons. Women who are strangled or choked are at risk of dying for up to 48 hours after the incident. So it's risky for that reason. It's also risky because it's a very intimate crime and uh, like a, uh, what we've found is that in almost 90% of cases where there was a DV homicide, there was at least one incident of strangulation or choking prior to um, death and that's the ones that we know about. It's entirely possible that it's higher than that. Uh, it's a very uh, dangerous activity and it indicates genuine risk as well. Recent or imminent separation is actually a big risk indicator too. So strangulation, choking and separation are two of the top five. Um, so if he believes that she's going to leave or she has recently left, her risk is quite high, higher than it would have been if she'd stayed in the relationship. Um, which is interesting because we, we suggest that women should leave violent relationships but it actually is more risky. Um, especially that first six weeks post-separation and then again at the 12 to 18 month point, which we think 
I guess we theorise is probably to do with the fact that things like divorces and property settlements and children's arrangements become finalised around that time. Escalating violence is something to be concerned about. So, and when I say escalating, I don't just mean in terms of um, the level of violence. I'm talking about frequency as well, or the level of unpredictability. Um, the other thing, stalking and surveillance. Again, we talked about that already. Abuse of children and/or animals it needs to be cons uh, considered. So, we're in a household where both the woman, children and animals are being abused, you need to be very concerned about the safety of all of the people in that house. Um, extreme sexual jealousy or sexual violence, again, especially that obsessive type. So a lot of women who um, have experienced serious injury or possible death have, dis have disclosed um, high levels of sexual jealousy, obsessiveness about her cheating. It, often when she hasn't, so he'll be accusing her of cheating even though she hasn't. hasn't. Um, it's very concerning. Um, a history of violence or any criminal activity needs to be um, considered. So interestingly, the level of violence in the criminal activity isn't relevant to their risk of being perpetrated. Any sort of controlling behaviour, mm -hmm. that obsessive controlling behaviour is actually one of the top five risk indicators as well. And not what you'd think in terms of mental health. The biggest risk indicator in terms of mental health issues for DV is actually the presence of depression. Um, so men who don't use violence in their personal relationships, i.e. most men who are depressed, don't pose a risk necessarily to anyone but themselves if they're seriously depressed or possibly suicidal. However, men who do use uh, violence in their personal relationships and are also depressed pose a big risk not just to themselves but also to their children and, and their wives or ex-wives as well. But, but there's a risk that they'll not only kill themselves but their wife and child or children. The other big socio-economic um, factor is actually loss of employment. So if he's recently lost his job, you need to be paying attention to that. Substance misuse, I'm not talking about just ice, <laughs> although that seems to be the flavour of the month. We're actually talking about um, any, I mean, alcohol can be a problem too. We're talking about um, changing in patterns of use, changing patterns of use of um, drugs and alcohol is what we're asking about in our risk assessment. So, does he use? If so, what does that look like for him in terms of his particular profile, and has that changed recently? If it's changed, it indicates a risk. Um, when we do a risk assessment, our key priority to focus on is obviously safety and safety above all things, even accountability for perpetrators. So we always have to prioritise safety, including working through the unintended consequences of any of our actions. That is one of the key things that we're looking at. Um, as I said earlier, risk assessment and safety planning are interrelated and yet discrete processes. They're two separate things that we're doing, often concurrently. Um, these are some of the things in that list that we are generally attending to when we do our thorough risk assessment. Um, I'd also like to say context is important when you're looking at RA. Um, an example of that would be if someone has threatened to blow up the house, uh, that might be, a, you know, it's a threat that we need to take seriously. However, if he's a bomb expert at the mines and has threatened to blow up the house, that becomes a much more meaningful threat all of a sudden. So we need to pay attention to a whole lot of details in order to make a thorough assessment or an accurate assessment. The victim is a very important source of information for your risk profile. Um, she is the one who's been living with him for maybe 20 years. She knows him better than anyone else and she knows what he's capable of. Um, we need to understand there's a whole range of things that she is doing to manage within that setting and she may not present all that well. If you've been abused for a pr prolonged period, you know, you might not be that focused on image management. You need to remember though that he will. Often men who use violence are extremely good image managers and that's part of their focus. So the Jekyll and Hyde type perpetrator we're talking about there. Um, we need to be aware that the system itself, as Ange was pointing to earlier, can actually place victims and children at greater risk. So we're not very good at making victims safer at this point in time. Um, so you'll have this slide. So those, those questions, though, are important factors or features of any risk assessment. Um, 
I just wanted to really quickly, I've got a couple of minutes to say that in terms of how abusers will present, no, they don't have a problem with anger, generally speaking. Some of them do, some of them are globally violent you know, to, to their family but also outside. They're the ones we tend to pick up in the criminal justice system. There's a huge proportion of them using violence who are white collar workers, functioning, have jobs, quite high paying jobs possibly, highly intelligent, highly charming but also using violence in the home. They're the ones we don't detect so well in our society these days. Um, they don't have a skill deficit when it comes to interpersonal skills. In fact, they're highly skilled usually in manipulation. And even people beyond the family can be a victim of that. So many schools, police officers, hospitals, other helping professionals will be talk, will talk about having the wool pulled over their eyes by these guys. They are extremely good um, manipulators and they don't like judgment. They know exactly what they're doing. It just benefits them. This is another myth too. Most abusers don't have low self-esteem. <laughs> the victims do but um, they tend not to. Uh, they tend, in fact, well, they have low empathy is probably the other, is the main issue. Um, most abusers don't have mental health or drug and alcohol problems. Um, so if they did, it would be very easy to solve domestic violence. The reality is there's no greater representation of domestic violence perpetrators in the, in, in the population of people with mental health issues than in the general, general population. The thing I'll say about drug and alcohol problems is that drugs and alcohol possibly can escalate the uh, level of violence in relationships, but it doesn't uh, introduce DV where it wasn't existing already. Um, people know, guys who are expressed remorse are only likely to change if they actually seek help as part of that process. If they're just saying sorry, they're probably going to do it again. Um, we need to remember that domestic violence is all of the forms of abuse I talked about. So physical violence is just one indicator of violence. There's lots of other indicators of violence as well. And I guess that final point, um, DV does affect children. It affects, uh, it's, a, and it's not a great parenting strategy. It's, it has poor outcomes for children in lots of different ways and Anna's going to talk about that more now. So that's me finished. Thanks guys. I look forward to your questions. Hi, I'm Anna Jones from Crimabee Tamira, a, um, as mentioned before, a child specialist service in domestic violence and child abuse. Um, I think one thing, as, as sort of mentioned, this is just a really small snapshot of, of what we've been talking about in relation to this issue and there's a whole lot more that could be said. Um, so what I've done a little bit here is popped in a few resources that you can um, you know, have a look up if you wanted to get a bit more information of that and also you can um, always email me and ask them more as well and I'm sure that's true for um, Beth and Angela. Um, so some of the basic areas that I'll be looking at is understanding um, children who have witnessed domestic violence and uh, what I want to do is just really um, situate children um, within domestic violence and create that understanding. I think often they're um, the hidden victims of this and we seem to think sometimes that the impact on, on women is the biggest factor and that children aren't impacted as much. Um, whereas I would argue that um, you know, whilst everybody's been impacted, the difference is that children um, are being impacted in their early stages of development which is incredibly problematic. Um, I'll have a bit of a look at domestic violence and parenting, um, how you might be able to identify if a child has been a victim of DV and I think when making parenting orders this is um, a bit of a difficult one to do in that often um, you know, ICLs might not never meet the children and people writing court reports will have such limited um, interaction with them and being able to capture that in such a small space is, can be quite difficult. Um, and then we'll have a look at when domestic violence sort of turns to abuse on contact and what that's like for children. Um, and then I'll briefly mention the problems of trying to counsel children who are currently being abused on contact. Um, this is a video that I won't show at the moment, but if you wanted to jump on, um, it's called Removed. If you just typed in, you can either go to this link or you can type in Remove um, and DV into Google and that'll come up and it just gives you a bit of an understanding of um, what that would be like to be a child in domestic violence. 
it is a little bit disturbing. I should put that caveat on as well. Sorry, um, just be prepared for that. So as um, Beck so fantastically mentioned already, um, you know, some of this sort of goes over that again, but from the perspective of the child is that domestic violence is a gendered issue um, and it's targeted at, at what is perceived as being um, weak victims within our society. So that's women and children. Um, we need to understand and elevate DV um, to the knowledge of being child abuse and that really impacts the development of children. It traumatises them. Um, in terms of their neurological development and it also negatively impacts their attachments. So domestic violence is a, um, it's an interpersonal type of trauma. So it really defines how young people go on to interact with people throughout their life. And obviously, um, as we know, domestic violence doesn't stop after separation. Um, and abuse on contact is just a continuation of this. And that looks different um, for female and, and children victims. It provides a new opportunity to continue to abuse the, um, the mum, but also the kids are then having unsupervised contact with a DV perpetrator and become and continue to be abused as well. So I think one of the one of the misconceptions we have about children and their development is, and I think this is um, perhaps a wish that we have as well, is that we like to think of children as being resilient. And and while that can be true, the truth is more that they're not necessarily resilient but malleable. So. They can change for good and they can change for bad. Um, you know, adverse circumstances affect them in negative ways. Positive circumstances affect them in positive ways. Um, and so what that means is we can't place a child continuously in a dangerous situation and expect them to recover from that and to be able to cope with that. We need to um, help them recover and, and balance out from the negative experiences they have. So a, a child who comes from a loving, caring home and is involved in a car accident, for example, um, is going to stand much better from that trauma than a child who grows up in domestic violence and is being traumatised within their relationships on a daily basis. So the biggest impact to child development is cumulative harm, um, that you know, it, it's ongoing, it's pervasive, um, it's consistent, yet might be um, potentially non-tangible um, and, and really um, ad hoc as well. And, and so what this does to children is it makes them feel unsafe, um, it decreases their sense of well-being um, and ultimately impacts their development. And so the biggest risk factor for children along with cumulative harm um, and less than adequate caregiving, so you're talking is, um, so let me rephrase that, so with multiple adverse events such as domestic violence and then less than adequate caregiving, which is also domestic violence, those two things are the biggest um, risk factors for child development. And that's exactly what domestic violence is. It's when the, the father who is meant to love and care for you is also the source of fear. Um, and those two things really impact how children develop in that we're meant, human beings are designed to move towards things that protect them and move away from things um, that are dangerous to them. And when that one thing is the same person, it's obviously very problematic. The other thing is that domestic violence also undermines the relationship between the child and the protective caregiver. Um, and there are, you know, that's probably a whole other um, presentation within itself, but there are various ways that that happens. So these are just some um, statistics as to how children are involved in domestic violence. I think sometimes we think about them as being sort of passive observers, the idea of the child behind the locked door whilst the domestic violence is happening. Um, and sometimes that is the case, but even then they're still hearing it, they're looking at the aftermath, they might have to call for help. Um, and other times that they are directly involved as well. Um, and that could be, um, you know, children getting punished for mum's acts or mum getting punished for children's acts. Um, sometimes the, the mum can harm the children as well. Um, and this is a really difficult circumstance where um, say the perpetrator is saying, you know, control the children or I'll step in and do it and, and she feels like she's better off um, doing the discipline because it's going to be a lot less work coming from her. And, and as mentioned before, that is one of the ways that um, it can harm the impact of the attachment between the children and the protective caregiver. So I think we have to get out of our minds that if children um, are present in the home whilst domestic violence is going on, that they might have missed it. The reality is that if they're present, they have witnessed it and we need to treat them as victims as well. 
So um, these are just a number of the ways that children are exposed to, to DV. And again, not passive observers. Um, they're, they're right in there. And sometimes um, it can be by proxy or it can be deliberately abusing the children as well. So I'll let you read over those in your own time. Um, when we're talking about domestic violence and parenting, half of the men who use physical assault against their partners will also physically assault their children. Um, as we know, um, domestic violence often occurs in pregnancy and is more likely to occur in couples with children. So what this means for, for children and young people is that they're actually at risk of domestic violence from the very beginning of life. And, and when I say life, I mean in utero as well, not just when they're born. And domestic violence has a really profound impact on the fetus. Um, the, the key component of understanding children in domestic violence is that children are more vulnerable the younger they are at the age of the trauma. So um, in the first year of life, they're more at risk than the second year of life and so on and so forth. Um, and then as mentioned before, the cumulative harm is what is, what is the, um, the biggest risk factor there. So I think Beth, uh, Beth said this um, nicely before is that you know, we, we can't separate out um, parenting and domestic violence perpetrating. Um, men who perpetrate violence can't be seen as responsible parents in that exposing your children to abuse is to the violence is abusive in itself. These are just some of the ways that um, that children express their difficulties. As you can see, it's, it's a list of just about most aspects of life, um, and and that is that is the truth when it comes to children and domestic violence. It impacts every um, aspect of their life. So when you're trying to identify children. Um, who have witnessed domestic violence and, and trying to work out, you know, I guess how much the impact has been um, or, or whether there was actually domestic violence in the home. You're looking for trauma symptoms in that domestic violence is inherently traumatising. As I mentioned before, it's also an interpersonal type of trauma, so do they have a lot of difficulties in relationships? Um, and as I mentioned, it also impacts just about every aspect of their life, so do they have problems across a range of domains? Um, and also do their difficulties lack explanation of some sort. So these are some of the, the trauma symptoms um, it, and it can go up to PTSD. They, uh, children often have um, increased stress hormone, heart rate, hypervigilance so an overactive response, uh, nervous response system. Um, they see people as being harmful. They have difficulty tolerating change and controlling their mood. Um, and they often are quite disconnected from their body as well and um, you know, unaware of what's going on and you can get issues like enuresis and necrosis um, and lack of temperature modulation um, and also not meeting developmental milestones. So I think we need to look at, um, rather than when we're making orders and considering children in DV, rather than looking at whether or not the children have witnessed violence. If we're dealing with the separation, we probably need to consider that it's an issue right from the start and operating on a rule it out rather than a rule it in basis. So whenever a child presents with difficulties, particularly if there's a separation in process, we need to consider that domestic violence is possibly an issue. Okay, so when domestic violence becomes abuse on contact, um, court ordered contact provides yet another opportunity for the perpetrator to continue to abuse both the mother and the children. Um, and they both obviously continue to be abused there. Sometimes um, repartnering can kind of distract the perpetrator, but not always. There are some perpetrators who will continue to use violence against their current partner, as well as a number of ex-partners and multiple children from different relationships. Um, DVO, whilst that they are highly beneficial when, um, when used correctly. They, very often children aren't listed on them and it's very difficult to get children listed on them. Um, and obviously you know, that doesn't stop something happening immediately to the mother or the children. So um, as Beck mentioned, these are some of the risk factors. So these factors don't necessarily create domestic violence, but they do exacerbate it. So for children going on contact where the father has been violent and also has some mental health issues or some drug and alcohol issues, the risk factors are increased for them. Um, in terms of listening to children, so writing court reports and things like that and when they come into counselling, um, 
I think often our society doesn't really know how to understand what children are telling us. We expect you know, a two-page snapshot of their lives and what they would like out of family contact. But the reality is, is most perpetrators aren't horrible all of the time. So kids will say that they miss their dad. They say that they love him, but they're afraid of him. Um, they will often talk about the abuse, not because they don't want to see their dad, but they want something to change. Um, the other thing is they will give little bits of information over long periods of time, but if nothing changes, they will often stop talking about that and they will report that nobody listened, nobody stopped the abuse, and talking about it didn't change anything, so they just sort of give up on us. Um, and sometimes their, their way of telling us can be really tangential and we have to listen really carefully to do that. So in terms of counselling, um, obviously for any child who's been harmed, they should be able to get counselling, but counselling also works on the proviso that children and young people are safe and children who are continually to be, continuing to be abused obviously aren't safe. So we have this really difficult balance of deciding when to and when not to engage children in counselling. Um, it's, it's a weighing up of you know, um, what's going to be more harmful, um, risks versus benefits. If, if there are risks that we... Um, we think are too great. We tend to work with the mums to um, then work on her relationship with the children and um, allow her to kind of do like the off-site therapy, as we call it. Because um, the last thing we want to do is put young people at more danger, um, in more danger than what they are. So this is just a very basic um, guide that we've come up with. It hasn't undergone any sort of testing or anything like that, so please do not take it as gospel. Um, but these are the sorts of questions that we ask ourselves when deciding whether or not to bring a young person in for counselling. The higher the risk of the things that Beth talked about, so stalking and surveillance, um, the less likely we are to see children um, because children will also be at risk from these sorts of things and, and some fathers will um, stalk their children through technology as well and pump them for information and things like that. But on the other hand, some um, perpetrators are also afraid of counsellors and think we have some sort of psychic mind reading ability. So um, those sort of fathers tend to stay pretty clear of us. Um, so we have a bit of an in there to do some work with the children. But the ones who are going to pump them for information can be incredibly dangerous and then create less safety for the children. Violence is bad. Children shouldn't have to be exposed to it, um, I think is, is my wrap up there. One thing that came up constantly in the training um, that a lot of the participants asked me was, would I then, given that information, recommend children have contact with an abusive parent? And I, I, what I said is that there's no sort of definitive research as to at what point you do and don't let a child have contact with, um, with a violent perpetrator. And I don't quite know what the clear answer is there. But what I do know is that um, domestic violence causes severe not only psychological but neurological development. Um, so in a nutshell, it basically causes brain damage in one form or another to children. And um, yeah, I'll leave you with that one, I think. Um, that kind of sums that up. Um, so that's my details there. So I, you will have a copy or will be getting a copy of these slides. Um, so feel free to get in contact with me if you have any further questions that I'm not able to answer for you today. Um, I've just added in at the end here some of the Duluth wheels. Um, so the contact details again are on there. They have a fabulous website um, with all sorts of resources and that really separates out what the difference between um, caring for children and the abuse of children is. And then also um, the post-separation power and control wheel which looks after, um, which looks essentially at um, abuse on contact and how domestic violence continues to go on after the relationship has ended. All right, so that's everything for my segment. Terrific. Thanks, Anna. Um, and also thanks to Beck and Ange. We do have some time for questions, so a reminder that there are a couple of ways that you can ask questions. One is to raise your hand and we'll unmute your microphone and, um, and then you can just speak through the ones of technology. The other is to answer or type a question into the questions box on the GoToWebinar um, control panel. Um, just a couple of things while people are starting to put their questions in. Um, firstly, um, as a couple of speakers have mentioned, we'll circulate a copy of these PowerPoints by email in the next little while, along with maybe some contact details for each of our speakers. If you've got anything to follow up, 
We'll also include on that email a link to the second half of this presentation, if you like, which is happening tomorrow morning and it will be Stephanie Hewitt from Women's Legal Service um, talking about the legal implications of some of the stuff that have been, has been spoken about today and some of the practical tools for people in legal practice uh, that kind of flow out of some of the issues that our speakers today uh, have discussed. Um, looks like our speakers have done a great job because those questions aren't coming through. Um, wow, that's pretty easy. Um, there's certainly plenty of people there to talk about you guys. Uh, all right. Well, if there are no questions, we'll circulate an email with some of those materials. Thanks for signing in. Oh, no, we do have someone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's a a general question about um, our panelists' thoughts on supervised time. Anna, maybe. Um. So by supervised time, um, I'm assuming you're meaning when the, the children go on contact with a um, partner who is using violence, and that's supervised either at a contact centre or sometimes by a family member. Um. I think supervised time with family members is very complicated um, because potentially you will have someone who's using violence with that family member as well um, and using power control tactics. Um, and so you have to question whether family members are really the best people to keep the children safe in that circumstance. Um, I think often contact centres are a good way to um, to start off contact if you're unsure as to how safe the situation is because then you've got external people who can um, supervise that obviously for the young person um, and then make a judgement as to whether or not it, it is or isn't helpful for them. Um, it also provides a, a really controlled environment so you're in the biggest risk obviously and the worst case scenario is homicide. So um, it really decreases the likelihood of that occurring on the contact visit if it's happening at a contact centre. Um, however, there are some young people who are so traumatised by the caregiver um, that supervised contact just continues to traumatise them really because any contact with that person um, is traumatising. Hi, it's, it's Beck. I probably would agree with Anna's points and just say that I guess the reality of our current system is that I guess if I had to choose, I'd choose supervised time over unsupervised time. And I guess, unfortunately, it's still viewed as a progression in my experience all the time. So that if supervised contact goes well, then it moves to unsupervised contact. Um, I question the wisdom of that in some cases, at least. I think it's good in some cases to assess even levels of commitment for contact, um, but there are there are some cases where it, there should be very limited contact or only supervised contact for extended periods. Um, there was another question that came through, guys, or a comment. Actually, we might take it as a Tony Jones comment, unless you've got something <laughs> to add um, about magistrates who um, don't include any reference to children in. Um, in domestic violence prevention orders and that there might be some education needed for the magist yes. magistrates. Um, I wonder if you guys have anything to add to that or if you want to just take it as a comment. Um, I guess <laughs> as the co-convener of DVCAN, the Domestic Violence Court Assistance Network who are in courts, uh, yes it does seem to be that sometimes magistrates aren't aware that you need to add some of those conditions. Um, Certainly our role as Court Assistance Network providers is that uh, we would try very hard to ensure magistrates are aware of that. But does it, yeah, it's actually not just magistrates, police prosecutors need to know that too so that they can request it if the magistrate says we're missing it too. But yes, it is important that that exception or that condition is made on orders. And it, and it can stem um, from um, a concern by magistrates of stepping into the family law realm. Mm -hmm. But really, um, they are—they um, do have authority um, pursuant to the Domestic Violence Act to um, um, prioritise safety and act protectively in relation to victims of violence. 
and really um, we would be arguing they should be um, making more orders um, in relation to children because of that reason. They have the authority um, under, the, under that legislation and they should be acting that way. Um, of course, um, there are a whole range of issues in relation to um, the family law system, um, the under-resourcing of that system, the under-resourcing of legal aid and community legal centres that perhaps play on um, magistrates' minds also um, when, they're, when they're making decisions about whether they should actually um, include children or not. Um, and a comment on that, that there is likely to be a half-day training session at the next magistrates' conference on domestic violence protection orders, um, which is great. Um, the question, guys, about what experiences you've had with family report writers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not sure if everyone heard that snort of derision coming from the back of the room there. So I might just let uh, Beck calm down a bit. Uh, if anyone's got something to <clears throat> kick off? <laughs> Um, that's, that's, this is Anna here. That, that's a great question. Um, th there's a lot of variability, I think. Um, I also think it's a very difficult task um, in that I think, as I mentioned briefly when I was talking, court report writers often spend very little time with the children. Um, and I think often um, what there's the difficulty in that perpetrators seem to just make up um, and often what he's done becomes what his partner's done. Um, and also victims will often downplay the abuse. So you get this situation where he's um, exact, or making up and accentuating what she has done and she's downplaying what he, what he has done. So, um, and I just say he and she as um, general descriptors. I realise there are male victims as well. But um, that then doesn't give a very clear picture of what's going on. So I think it's incredibly hard to get a proper snapshot of what's happening for the family in such a short period of time. Um, and then also you get children who, if they've been put with both parents, um, you know, it's incredibly stressful for them as well. And often they're not really sure on what they're doing there and, and what's going on. Um, and they're also sometimes so terrified of their father that they're not going to be honest about what um, is going on as well. Um, simply because you know his presence means that they're going to be um, censoring what they say. So I think there probably really just needs to be a bit of an overhaul um, of how we do things and spending more time with the children, taking more information into account. Um, you know, school reports, talking to counsellors. Um, we get very few phone calls from report writers, um, which is an interesting um, space to be in. Um, yeah. Um, and the specifics of the question talked about um, family court, sorry, um, the reports noting that children aren't the direct victims uh, of family violence and that kind yeah, of thing. Okay, yeah, that. that's, that's a great question. I actually think that that's just a myth. I think, you know, and, and some of my slides have a bit more information on that, um, is that there's no such thing as children not being the victims. Um, even if they aren't being directly physically assaulted and they're not presenting with bruises that we can then log to child safety and saying it's happening or file a you know child assault form or something. It's it's they're still victims, it still negatively impacts them. Um, I think we need to move away from child children be seen as passive observers um, and them not being the direct victims in the home, they are the direct victims, um, whether or not they've been hit or not. It's Angela here, and just letting you know, just um, quickly, that there, um, there's a real, um, I suppose it's an, it's an issue in relation to family reports that we have identified over a long period of time of how um, domestic violence is um, assessed in those courts, and that um, Women's Legal Services Australia has um, put a call out for, um, you know, real, I suppose a level of accountability, um, a level of um, some really um, specific training for family report writers in relation to this area and also for some research in this area as well into are family reports the best way of making assessments of um, family violence and other kinds of abuse. 
So um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's um, it's a big question, and just letting you know that um, um, there have been some there has been some work in that area in relation to women's legal services around the country. And I might just chip in there too, Ange. If anyone participating in the webinar has some uh, case studies or examples of where that stuff isn't working well, please do feel free to send them through because we'd really like to feed this into some of the systemic advocacy that's happening across the country. Right. Probably, it's Becky, probably just one thing I'd add is maybe to highlight that point that was um, implied that what that says to me, a report like that, is a serious lack of training in relation to domestic and family violence. And I, I guess our position is that uh, anyone writing family court reports needs to be au fait with some of the stuff that we've been talking about this morning um, in order to make an accurate assessment of um, that family situation. All right, we have gone a little bit over time. Can I, on behalf of people sitting at their computer screens across the country, um, cheering wildly, thank <laughs> Anna, Rebecca and Ange for that um, really informative and useful presentation. As I said, please do register for the second half, uh, which talks a little bit more about um, the way that this stuff uh, should influence your legal practice. Um, but thank you all for participating and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you.